Francis Bacon's Measure for Measure. This video is dedicated to Dr. W.S. Melsom, President of the Francis Bacon Society, Editor of Baconiana and responsible for the pioneering work on Francis Bacon and Measure for Measure. While Francis Bacon was residing in France at the English Embassy in Paris under the charge of Sir Amos Paulette, Ambassador to France, working on behalf of the English Secret Service, on the 17th of March 1579 he had a dream or vision that his father's house at Gorhambury was plastered all over with black mortar. Three days later, his beloved foster father and mentor, Lord Keeper and de facto Lord Chancellor of England, Sir Nicholas Bacon, died on the 20th of February, 1579. When news of his death eventually reached Francis in Paris, he left for England on the 20th of March, 1579, carrying a number of secret dispatches for Queen Elizabeth and her chief ministers and members of the Privy Council. By the time he reached England and made his way up to London, the solemn funeral ceremony of Sir Nicholas Bacon, attended by all the great and good of Elizabethan society, headed by his brother-in-law Sir William Cecil and spymaster Sir Francis Walsingham, had already taken place. With his brother-in-law, the Principal Secretary of State, Sir William Cecil Lord Burley, Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon was the Grand Architect of the Elizabethan Protestant Reformation, the consequences of which still reverberate around the world to the present day. The kingdom had lost a towering statesman and a great agent for change, and his son who loved and idolised him had lost a father, a friend and a great mentor. His father, Sir Nicholas Bacon, had been Lord Keeper and Elizabeth for nearly 20 years. It is not too much to say that from the first, the elder Bacon's precept and example, and after his death, his memory were absolutely decisive in making his son Francis the Bacon that we know. The great Lord Keeper, Sir Nicholas Bacon, died in suspicious circumstances, most likely by poisoning, as there is reason to believe at the hands of his adversary, the notorious poisoner and murderer Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. In the tragedy of Hamlet, in shadowing real-life events, Francis portrays the death of Hamlet's father, Old Hamlet, the refracted figure of his foster father, Sir Nicholas Bacon, through poisoning at the hands of King Claudius, the refracted figure of his blood father, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, husband to Queen Gertrude, mother to Prince Hamlet, modelled upon Queen Elizabeth, the royal secret royal mother of Francis Tudor Bacon, Prince of Wales. The tragedy of Hamlet shares many similarities with Measure for Measure in terms of their style, themes and content. Both incorporate religious themes and imagery. In Measure for Measure, its central character, the Duke, disguises himself as a Franciscan friar, and Isabella is about to become a nun, with Hamlet issuing his edict for Ophelia to join a nunnery. The Duke's appointed deputy, Angelo's speech on prayers in Measure for Measure, is often compared to that of a similar speech of King Claudius in Hamlet. There is a pervasive atmosphere and culture of surveillance at Elsinore in Denmark, and similarly an atmosphere and culture of surveillance in Vienna. In Hamlet, the play within a play, The Murder of Gonzago, depicts a murder done in Vienna of a duke, one Hamlet commissions in order to determine Claudius's guilt in the death of his father. There is something rotten in the state of Denmark and in Measure for Measure. Hamlet philosophically declares Denmark's prison. And Measure for Measure, in a more literal sense, explores the twin themes of imprisonment and freedom.
The play of Hamlet is full of law and the central theme of Measure for Measure is law and justice on a local and national level, relating to its enactment, administration and enforcement. Parallels have also been drawn between the soliloquies of Hamlet on suicide and death and the speeches of the Duke and Claudio on imminent death. And both Hamlet and Measure for Measure are all-encompassing meditations upon life and death, the same subjects explored by Bacon in his essay of Death and his two full-length treatises, an inquiry concerning the ways of death, the postponing of old age and the restoring of the vital powers, and the more succinctly and aptly titled The History of Life and Death. It is clear and self-evident Hamlet and Measure for Measure were written around the same time as each other, with nearly all Shakespeare scholars believing Measure for Measure was composed during the period of the publication of the first and second quarter of Hamlet. Yet the first version of Hamlet was written in the early 1580s, with the main sources for Measure for Measure written by a similar date allowing for the possibility that the first version of the latter was also written in the early or by the mid-1580s. A similar theme to the tale told in Measure for Measure is found in the Latin tragedy Philonera by Claude Ruillet, a literary professor at the Collège de Bourgogne in Paris, whose Varia Poemata contained four plays on moral and religious themes. A French translation of Philonera was published at Paris in 1563 and again at Paris by Nicolas Bonfant in 1577. At the time of the 1577 translation, Bacon was residing with Sir Amos Paulet at the English Embassy in Paris and would have most probably purchased a copy of it from one of the bookstalls or bookshops within a few minutes walk of his official residence. The primary source for Measure for Measure is the Hector Mithi, first published in 1565 by the Italian poet and dramatist Giraldi Cinthio, and translated into French by Gabriel Chapuis in 1584. There was no contemporary English version of the work, and Bacon read it in both the original Italian and French translation. Some time before his death in 1573, Cynthio adapted his story into a five-act play called Epitia, published in Venice at 1583 by his son Celso Giraldi. A number of Shakespeare scholars have pointed to the many detailed verbal parallels between Cynthio's extremely rare, then and now, drama Epitia, also written in Italian and measure for measure a language that Francis learned from his foster mother, Lady Anne Cook Bacon, who translated from Italian the sermons of the Sienese preacher Bernardine Occino. The Hakato Mythi was drawn upon by the poet and dramatist George Whetstone for his two-part drama entitled The Right Excellent and Famous History of Promus and Cassandra the most important source for Measure for Measure, about a virtuous lady who sacrifices her virginity to a hypocritical magistrate in order to save the life of her brother. The work, published in the middle of 1578, is dedicated to Sir William Fleetwood, Recorder of London, who lived at Bacon House in Foster Lane, built by his longtime friend, Lord Keeper, Sir Nicholas Bacon. Modern Shakespeare editors of Measure for Measure, none of whom mention Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon, have in recent times devoted considerable attention to the remarkable similarities between the right excellent and famous history of Promus and Cassandra and Measure for Measure, which they have set out in extensive and minute detail. For several years before the publication of Promus and Cassandra, George Whetstone was already moving in the rarefied circles of the Cook, Bacon, Cecil family, whom acted as his patron and assisted in the publication of his works.
His first work, The Rock of Regard, is divided into four parts, with the Orchard of Repentance warmly dedicated to Sir William Cecil's eldest son, Sir Thomas Cecil. The Little Red work also includes verses to Bacon's maternal aunts, Lady Elizabeth Cook Hobie Russell and Lady Mildred Cook Cecil, the younger and elder sisters of Lady Anne Cook Bacon, who Whetstone described as both beautiful and virtuous and paid fulsome compliment to their celebrated learning. The year following the publication of Promus and Cassandra, the great Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon died in February 1579, and within weeks of his death, Whetstone penned a long laudatory poem entitled A Remembrance of the Worthy and Well-Employed Life of the Right Honourable Sir Nicholas Bacon. He described his patron Sir Nicholas Bacon, a man of virtue and integrity, as a great pillar of the state and Solomon of the law. For several years after the death of his patron, Whetstone moved in the same private social and literary circles as the great scion of the family Francis Bacon, with whom he secretly liaised on a number of literary projects, including writings printed in the name of George Gascoigne, one of Bacon's early literary masks. If he had lived long enough, Whetstone would have been gratified to see how Bacon, whom he knew was a concealed poet and dramatist, made much use of Promus and Cassandra. The plot of Promus and Cassandra was retold in the prose narrative of his Heptameron of Civil Discourses, published in 1582, and the themes of A Mirror for Magistrate of Cities by Whetstone, published in 1584, might also have proved useful for Bacon when writing Measure for Measure. All these writings would doubtless have evoked remembrances of things past for Bacon regarding his beloved father, Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon, who Whetstone, in his elegy to his patron, Sir Nicholas, had lauded to the high heavens. In the recent groundbreaking chapter, The Assize Circuitry of Measure for Measure, in her work, Legal Reform in English Renaissance Literature, Professor Strain frames and commences it with the policy words set out by Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon in his parliamentary speeches. In his closing oration, the Lord Keeper addressed the country's provincial magistrates, admonishing them to put into practice the statutes that were especially prioritised by central policy. He warned of the dangers of bad justices who failed to enforce the law, and especially of negligent and corrupt office holders who posed the most insidious threat to order by inviting the contempt of all authority. At the turn of the 17th century, the Court of Assize was responsible for overseeing and reforming the execution of local justice and governance throughout the country. The major features of the Assize system, the stages of its cyclical structure, the aspects of legal spectacle, the alternating surveillance and exposure of local office holders, the expectation that justice and legal process transformed private into public knowledge, the tensions between central and local authorities, between Assize judges and JPs, and between the rule of law and, it, and its execution, all inform the plot and the characterisation of legal officers in Measure for Measure. This limitation of central government inspired Bacon's most ambitious proposal for legal reform, a system of regular provincial visitations to evaluate the performance of local officers. As an advisor to James I, to his favourites and as Lord Chancellor, his son Francis would take pains to advocate and insinuate the investigation of local officers as a vital function of the assize judges who were already responsible for holding court throughout the country during law term vacations. I argued that the Assize judge's responsibility for the oversight of local justice informs the structure and ethics of Measure for Measure.
In a letter of advice to the King's favourite, the Duke of Buckingham, Francis Bacon explained to him in a section touching the laws, wherein I mean the common laws of England, that if rightly administered, serves as a balance between the prince and the people and would be of great benefit to the kingdom. He informs him that King James would be well advised to take advantage of his circuit judges and make use of them as important sources of information and intelligence for the purposes of law and order and well-being of his kingdom and people. Indeed, little should be done in legal consultations without them, and very much may be done by their prudent advices, especially in their circuits, if right use were made of them. Believe me, sir, much assistance would be had from them, besides the delivering, uh, delivering of the jails and trying of causes between party and party, if the king, by himself, which were the best, or by his chancellor, did give them the charge according to occurrences at their going forth, and receive a particular account from them at their return home. They would then, to the best intelligences of the true state of the kingdom, and the surest means to prevent or remove all growing mischiefs within the body of the realm. The same advice presented here by Bacon informs the modus operandi of the Duke of Vienna in Measure for Measure, via the device that frames from its outset the central plot of the play, one which runs throughout its entirety to the final act, when the Duke, who has been secretly surveying his state, legal officials and citizens, finally reveals his true identity, as explained by Professor Strain. The same coupling of local surveillance and legal spectacle that was orchestrated by the Assize judge is easily observed in Shakespeare's Measure for Measure, in which Duke Vincentio secretly surveys the operations of the Viennese justice system and then exposes its corrupt elements in trial. Early in 1597, Bacon set forth the first edition of Essays, together with Meditation Sacrae in Latin, and in English, of the colours of good and evil. The ten essays were written in a terse, aphoristic style, or short, pithy maxims on subjects concerning public and private life. In a now little-known work, the orthodox Shakespeare scholar Morton Luce observed that a full appreciation of Measure for Measure could not be had without knowledge of these three works. It may encourage the student if I direct him to Bacon's Colours of Good and Evil and his Meditation Sacre and the earliest essays, which I think Shakespeare must have been studying about this time. And in dealing with this philosophy of morals, as we find it in Measure for Measure, I must again refer to Bacon. But there is more in it. Among the antitheta in the play, none so elaborate as the antitheta of life and death. And for their full exposition, this treason of Claudio was essential. I have already called attention to Bacon and his philosophies and his methods. Herein they find their best illustration. And as Bacon's essays on death are in praise not of death but of fortitude, so Shakespeare's in, in this play would teach us that life is best. Of the Duke as a reflection of Shakespeare and an earlier Prospero, I have spoken elsewhere, and in this personal interest of the dramatist is the best explanation of the somewhat unusual proportion of the drama that is assigned to this character. It might or might not come as a surprise that over the course of the previous century, none of the major editions of Measure for Measure, RSC, Oxford, Cambridge, Arden, all aimed at the schoolmen, university students and the interested readers, have included a discussion of Bacon in any of their long prefaces and introductions. The principal reason Bacon is ignored and suppressed, or only occasionally glanced at in the major editions of the Shakespeare plays, is due to the so-called authorship question. And in the case of the legal play, Measure for Measure, it is all the more conspicuous considering Bacon, with Coke, was one of the most important lawyers and legal writers of the Elizabethan and Jacobean period.
A drama we are about to see that is infused throughout with his legal, political, philosophical and scientific inquiries into nature and literary DNA. Before we proceed to examine the play in its entirety, it is important to examine the complex and enigmatic character of Duke Vincentio, which has produced a great deal of debate and discussion among Shakespeare scholars and critics. The role of the controversial Duke, one of the longest in the Shakespeare canon, has been present, presented in print from an all-seeing, all-knowing God, or Christ-like figure, all along the spectrum to a manipulative Machiavellian strategist, and similarly in the theatre via conflicting and contradictory portrayals from a godlike figure to every kind of sinister, ruthless and cynical manipulator of power it is possible to imagine. It appears there are as many opinions on Duke Vincentio as there are critics, nearly all of whom misinterpret and misrepresent him. Few, if any, truly know him, and none of whom have unmasked and revealed his true identity. In his essay, Vincentio's Selves in Measure for Measure, Professor Hunt points out that Duke Vincentio, probably the most complex figure in Shakespeare and comedy, possesses a public and private self, which are often at odds with each other. According to Hunt, the enigmatic and dissimulating Duke has three selves that can be termed as Machiavellian, holy and sexual. The Duke appears, observes Professor Jordan, in multiple perspectives, as himself, as Friar Ludwig, as a responsible prince and a Machiavellian strategist. In actual historical terms, the character of Duke Vincentio has, by a significant number of Shakespeare commentators, been compared with King James, a mistaken suggestion now rejected and dismissed. And, writes Professor Garber, as often as this Duke has been compared to King James, he has also been compared to Shakespeare, or to a playwright, ordering his cast and bringing about his plot devices, dramatic surprises and denouements. Indeed, writes Professor Leggett, the Duke is a surrogate for the playwright himself. With the joint editors of the recent Arden edition of Measure for Measure correctly maintaining that our author sets up the correspondences between himself and the Duke so extensively, and that Measure for Measure persistently hints that the Duke is a playwright made in Shakespeare's image. Or, put another way, the complex and enigmatic character of Duke Vincentio, who adopts multiple masks, disguises and identities in Measure for Measure, represents Shakespeare. That is to say, the true author of the play, who himself, outside of the play itself, also adopts multiple identity, identities and disguises behind his various literary masks, including the pseudonym of Shakespeare. So, asks Professor Jordan, what kind of a man is the Duke? The same question that can be asked about the author of Measure for Measure. He may be regarded, insist Professor Jonathan Bate and Eric, Eric Rasmussen, joint editors of the recent RSC edition of the Complete Works, as a godlike figure, benignly controlling the world of the play from behind the scenes. He might also be regarded as the equivalent godlike figure who behind the scenes secretly penned Measure for Measure, and as another masked, disguised representation of himself, the character of Duke Vincentio. In The Wheels of Fire, a work which has been described as the best single work of Shakespeare criticism, the incomparable Professor G. Wilson Knight, probably the most wholehearted and devoted Shakespearean of all time, provides us with a still unsurpassed illuminating character portrait of Duke Vincentio. He begins by telling us that the play is a very carefully constructive work which tends towards allegory or symbolism and that the characters of the play tend to illustrate certain human qualities chosen with careful reference to the main theme. The atmosphere, purpose and meaning of the play are throughout ethical. 
the duke lord of this play in the exact sense that prospero is lord of the tempest is the prophet of an enlightened ethic he controls the action from start to finish he allots as it were praise and blame he is lit at moments with divine suggestion comparable with his almost divine power of foreknowledge and control and wisdom there is an enigmatic otherworldly mystery suffusing his figure his government has been inefficient not through an inherent weakness or of laxity in him but rather because meditation and self-analysis together with profound study of human nature have shown him that all passions and sins of other men have reflected images in his own soul to such a philosopher government and justice may begin to appear a mockery and become abhorrent the duke's sense of human responsibility is delightful throughout he is like a kindly father and all the rest are his children thus he now performs the experiment of handing the reins of government to a man of aesthetic purity the scheme is a plot or trap a scientific experiment to see if extreme aesthetic righteousness can stand the test of power as the play progresses and his plot on angelo works he assumes an ever increasing mysterious dignity his original purpose seems to become more and more profound in human insight the action marches with measured pace to its appointed and logical end he holds within the dramatic universe the dignity and power of a prospero to whom he is strangely similar with both their plot and plan is the plot and plan of the play they make and forge the play and thus are automatically to be equated in a unique sense with the poet himself since both are symbols of the poet's controlling purposeful combined movement of the chessmen of the drama methinks he knew of whom he spoke and does everything but name him the duke was a lawyer a philosopher and a scientist who seeks mastery over nature a prophet of an enlightened ethic concerned with what is good for individual society and the rest of the human race he likens him to the scientific philosopher prophet prospero once duke of milan the central character of the rosicrucian play the tempest who through his power controls nature and the future destiny of the world which evokes its utopian coeval of new atlantis or land of the rosicrucians where its rc brothers through the divine institution of solomon's house pursue all the arts and sciences for the advancement and benefit of mankind thus duke vincentio appears to be a mirror image of his shakespearean creator francis bacon something he continually reveals to us throughout the whole play as all serious shakespeare scholars are perfectly aware names are important and the names of characters in the plays are almost invariably carefully chosen and selected the name vincentio means conqueror the victorious one which in this case could be taken to mean the one destined to rule or be victorious over nature in his long essay professor hunt asks why does the duke want to assume a friar's disguise when any number of secular disguises could serve his purpose in this instance the selection of the duke's disguise as a friar was done deliberately and for a very specific reason in his measure for measures hoods and masks the duke isabella and liberty professor gurr points out that the simple robes and large hoods of wandering friars made use of in measure for measure was an excellent device to conceal the wearer's face or identity what is most striking about his use of the friar disguise in measure for measure observes professor gurr is that he apparently had a disconcertingly intimate knowledge of the franciscans and in particular of the minor order of women franciscans the nuns of st clair the eponymous order of st clair was founded at assisi italy in 1212 when the 18 year old claire received her habit from the hands of francis of assisi she eventually established the second order of st francis at san damiano before the end of the 13th century the order of st clair was founded in england in an area near the tower still known as the minories 
In England, they followed the regime of her later follower, Isabella of Este, sister of Louis IX, King of France, and founder of the Monastery of the Humility of the Blessed Virgin Mary at Longchamp, near Paris, author of the so-called Isabella Rule, which governed the women Franciscans. The order thrived for, for more than two centuries, up until the dissolution of monasteries, when the nunnery of the Clares or minoresses were surrendered to Henry VIII in 1539. The Bacons greatly benefited from the dissolution of the monasteries. Following the dissolution throughout the 1540s, Sir Nicholas Bacon began building a landed estate, purchasing land and properties, many of them formerly belonging to the monasteries, in his native Suffolk, where he built his first family seat at Redgrave, as well as in Norfolk, Essex and London. In the case of the latter, this included property close to the Abbey of the Order of St. Clair, located in Aldergate Without, on the eastern boundary of the city. The nuns' chapel became a parish church, and later in the 16th century the church was a Puritan stronghold where John Field and Thomas Wilcox preached, both of whom were supported and patronised by Sir Nicholas and Lady Anne Bacon, who secretly provided funds for some of their clandestine publications. Thus we see the Duke adopted the disguise of a Franciscan friar, an order founded by St Francis of Assisi, with its clear reference to the Christian name Francis, whose dissolved church had links with his father and mother, Sir Nicholas and Lady Anne Baker. In addition to the Isabella rule governing the female Franciscan order, the name Isabella carried for Bacon further layers of concealed meaning. Isabel, the shortened form of Isabella, was the name of his grandmother Isabel Bacon, mother of his father Nicholas Bacon, and the name Isabel Isabella is a version of Elizabeth, a possible glance at his natural mother Queen Elizabeth, the so-called Virgin Queen. In the play, Isabella arrives on stage in Act 1, Scene 4, under the stage direction, Enter Isabella and Francisca a nun. Isabella is about to become a novice of the Order of St. Clair. However, the only qualified nun in the play is named Francisca, the feminine version of Francis, the umpteenth disguise allusion to Bacon himself. The brief passage in the scene is located in the Order of St. Clair. And have you nuns no father privileges? Are not these large enough? Yes, truly, I, I speak not as desiring more, but rather wishing a more strict restraint upon the sisterhood, the votarists of St. Clair. Ho, peace be in this place. Who's that which calls? It is a man's voice. Gentle Isabella, turn you the key and know his business of him. You may, I may not, you are yet unsworn. When you have vowed, you must not speak with men, but in the presence of the prioress. Then, if you speak, you must not show your face, or, if you show your face, you must not speak. The Duke pretends to leave Vienna for Poland, and returns disguised as a friar of the Franciscan order, under the carefully chosen name or pseudonym of Friar Ludovic. From Ludovic, the Latin name Ludovicus, which means victorious, evolved into the Old French as Louis and into English as Louis, derives the English name of Louis. In Freemasonry, a Louis denotes a Freemason brought into the Brotherhood by his father and is also a Freemasonic symbol of strength. It lent its name to the Louis Masonic, the oldest Masonic publisher in the world, which produces the ritual books of the United Grand Lodge of England and other Freemasonic publications. Thus, from behind his various disguises and pseudonyms, Bacon, Duke Vincentio in Measure for Measure, is a secret member of the Rosicrucian Freemasonic Brotherhood, working in the real world and through the allegory of the play for the advancement and benefit of all humankind. Let us now turn to the opening of the play. The provenance and progenitor of Measure for Measure should have been obvious to any Bacon Shakespeare scholar from the Duke's first speech on the inner workings of the science of government. 
The Duke, Bacon, says to Aeschylus that when it comes to understanding the nature of the people, the city's institutions and the standards of law and justice, he, Aeschylus, is more knowledgeable in theory and in practice than any he remembers. Of government, the properties to unfold would seem in me to affect speech and discourse, since I am put to know that your own science exceeds in that the lists of all advice my strength can give you. Then no more remains but this, to your sufficiency as your worth is able, and let them work. The nature of our people, our cities' institutions and the terms for common justice, you're as pregnant in, a, in as art and practice hath enriched any that we remember. There is our commission, from which we would not have you warp. There is a near universal consensus among Shakespeare scholars that measure for measure, none of whom consider a date for its composition in the early to mid 1580s when Shakespeare was in Stratford, was conceivably begun or should we say revised at some unspecified time during 1603 and completed in the spring or summer or even perhaps towards the end of 1604. This proved a fruitful period of writing for Bacon in 1603, he composed A Confession of Faith, a brief discourse touching the happy union of the kingdoms of England and Scotland, and during this period, stretching from 1603 to 1605, The Advancement of Learning, in which he devoted a long passage on government and law, much of it an epitome of the combined interwoven central themes of government and law in Measure for Measure, which I here only quote in part. Concerning government, it is a part of knowledge secret and retired, in both these respects in which things are deemed secret. For some things are secret because they are hard to know, and some because they are not fit to utter. We see all governments are obscure and invisible. Such is the description of governments. We see the government of God over the world is hidden, insomuch as it seemeth to participate of much irregularity and confusion. Notwithstanding, for the more public part of government, which is laws, I think good to note only one deficiency, which is that all those which have written of laws have written either as philosophers or as lawyers and none as statesmen. In Measure for Measure, we see the intertwining of nature in the fullest sense of the word and the law in the fullest sense of the word, which at its highest level is seen in theological, philosophical and scientific terms as the immutable law of nature, wonderfully captured by Professor Hansen in her essay, Measure for Measure and the Law of Nature. The purpose of this essay is to suggest that in posing this question, measure for measure with its ambiguous entwining of law and nature, engages not only with questions of civil law, such as the relationship between law and equity, absolutism and common law, and civil and religious authority, but also with contemporary discourse regarding the idea of a law of nature, that is, of compelled regularity within the order of physical creation. By the end of the 17th century, an invocation of a law of nature was a marker for explicitly scientific discourse, as when Newton begins his mathematical principles of natural philosophy by distinguishing the moderns from the ancients on the grounds that the former have undertaken to explain the phenomena of nature by mathematical laws. When Measure for Measure was first staged in 1604, the potential for such a concept to structure an autonomous domain of scientific inquiry was already evident, particularly in the writings of Francis Bacon. But the idea was still imbricated with questions both of theology and of political sovereignty. For Bacon, writes Professor Hansen, the law of nature is inseparable from that of the legislating God, and the year before Measure for Measure was first performed, Bacon wrote a Confession of Faith, first printed in 1641, in which he affirms his belief that God
created heaven and earth and all their armies and generations and gave unto them constant and everlasting laws which we call nature which is nothing but the laws of the creation which laws nevertheless have had three changes or times and are to have a fourth and last As we have seen around the time Bacon revised Measure for Measure and Confessions of Faith, he also penned a political philosophical treatise, a brief discourse touching the happy union of the kingdoms of England and Scotland, which he dedicated in private to His Majesty. In the treatise, Bacon makes explicit the affinity between the laws of nature and the rules of government and policy. For there is a great affinity and consent between the rules of nature and the true rules of policy, the one being nothing else but an order in the government of the world, and the other an order in the government of a state. And therefore the education and erudition of the kings of Persia was in the contemplations of nature and an application thereof to a sense politic, taking the fundamental laws of nature with the branches and passages of them as an original and first model whence to take and describe a copy and imitation for government. Like King James and the Persian kings, says Professor Hansen, Duke Vincentio is a student of the properties of government, as he announces in the first lines of a play whose action will unfold what it means to acquire and wield knowledge. What she could have said is like Bacon, lest we forget the author of the Union of the Kingdoms of England and Scotland, who, like his father, Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon, understood the secret inner workings of government and wrote several essays and papers touching upon the subject. His dramatic character incarnate the Duke was a master of the properties of government, the public part of which, as Bacon informs us, is laws. With Aeschylus given the papers of his commission, one of the lords summons Angelo, and the Duke speaks with Aeschylus about his impending plan to place Angelo in charge of government while he's away. What figure of us think you he will bear? For you must know we have with special soul elected him our absence to supply, lent him our terror, dressed with our love, and given his deputation all the organs of our own power. What think you of it? If any in Vienna be of worth to undergo such ample grace and honour, it is Lord Angelo. Concerning this passage, Rivier and Santin Gettier, in their article entitled If, What If, Hypothesis as a Leitmotif in Measure for Measure, headed by the quotation, If a man will begin in certainties, he shall end in doubts. But if he will be content to begin with doubts, he shall end in certainties. Make the following observation. As Francis Bacon's acknowledgement quoted above implies, if things were all clearly settled in advance, there would be no space for self-awareness or pardon. This is particularly revealing in Shakespeare's Measure for Measure, contemporary to this quotation, where, from the beginning, nothing is obvious and considered at face value. The Duke's question to Aeschylus, while he is about to appoint Angelo as the deputy of Vienna in his absence, what think you of it, sets the tone, showing that despite decisions made, doubts remain. In his answer, Aeschylus voices the first hypothetic clause of the play, if any in Vienna be of worth, it is Angelo. The Duke informs Angelo that he is to appoint him head of government in charge of all of its laws and the welfare of the people while he is away. In our remove be thou at full the ourself. Mortality and mercy in Vienna live in thy tongue and heart. Old Aeschylus, though first in question, is thy secondary. Take thy commission. Now, good my lord, 
Let there be some more test made of my metal, be so noble and great a figure be stamped upon it. In his article, Vincentio's Selves in Measure for Measure, Professor Hunt explains that the Duke intends to perform a scientific experiment to test Angelo's metal to the fullest, a Baconian scientific test to see whether his much vaunted integrity and moral fortitude is capable of dealing in an upright and honest manner as the newly appointed head of the Vienna government. Closely bound up with Vincentio's Machiavellian use of Ange Angelo to protect himself from censure for his lax enforcement of Vien Viennese law, is his testing of him to see whether power will corrupt this puritanical man. Its deeply enigmatic purpose makes this latter behaviour appear Machiavellian. There is a kind of character, handwriting or engraved pattern in thy life, Vincentio tells Angelo that to the observer doth thy history fully unfold. But if Vincentio believed that Angelo's life had fully unfolded, him to an observer, he would not need to assay it, subject his metal to a trial to experimentation. In 1605, Sir Francis Bacon published his revolutionary The Advancement of Learning, which prepared the way for the widespread recovery of the modern scientific method, where an experiment determined the probability of a hypothesis through conducting a number of tests on the makeup of a subject. As he is about to leave, the Duke reaffirms to Angelo that he has invested him with all his powers and that he can enforce or qualify the law as his soul and conscience sees fit. But just before he departs, the Duke reveals that while he dearly loves the people, he prefers, like an invisible Rosicrucian brother, to remain in the shadows, neither expecting or wanting any thanks or applause. I love the people, but do not like to stage me to their eyes. Though it do well, I do not relish well their loud applause and Aves vehement, nor do I think the man of safe discretion that does affect it. In her truly revealing essay, The Assize Circuitry of Measure for Measure, Professor Strain argues that the Assize judge's responsibility for the oversight of local justice informs the structure and ethics of the play, and the first scene when the Duke departs Vienna bears the mark of the circuit judge's dissolution and withdrawal after their sessions has ended. In a speech delivered in the Star Chamber while the King was away in Scotland concerning the judges and justices before they departed for their summer circuits, Bacon, Lord Keeper of the Realm, gives them the following advice, the concluding part of which echoes the words of the Duke in Measure for Measure. You that are the judges of circuits are, as it were, the planets of the kingdom, and no doubt you have a great stroke in the frame of this government, as the other have in the great frame of the world. Do therefore as they do, move always and be carried with the motion of your first mover, which is your sovereign. A popular judge is a deformed thing, and plaudits are fitter for players than for magistrates. Do good to the people, love them and give them justice, but let it be, as the psalm saith, looking for nothing, neither praise nor profit. Before the Duke leaves, Aeschylus requests a more precise and detailed explanation of his powers and place. In his essay of Great Place, Bacon writes, For good thoughts are little better than good dreams, except they be put in act, and that cannot be without power and place.
With the Duke having supposedly left Vienna, Angelo begins his administration by ordering the closure of the bawdy houses, one of which is owned by Mistress Overdone, who inter interrupts the lewd conversation of Lucio and two gentlemen to tell them Claudio has been sentenced to death for having made Juliet pregnant on account of some long neglected act. As Mistress Overdone approaches, Lucio quips that he had purchased many diseases under her roof, a cost of in the region of $3,000 a year. And after fending off their jibe, she tells them she had seen Claudio arrested and carried away, and which is more, within three days his head to be chopped off. If we remove from the number 3,000 the three nulls, the noughts, and place it the number three, three days, it yields 33, Bacon in simple, cif simple cipher. And nor is this the only Baconian cryptographic signature enciphered in two other related passages. The clownish servant Pompey arrives and tells Mistress Overdone of a new law or legal proclamation ordering all brothels in the suburbs of Vienna will be pulled down. The provost appears and on the special orders of Angelo parades Claudio through the street to punish and humiliate him. Lucio meets Claudio on his way to prison and asks why he is under arrest. From too much liberty, my Lucio, liberty. For what offence, he asks, is it murder? No, lechery, he replies. The provost intervenes. Away, sir, you must go. But Claudio had more he wanted to say, to which the provost assented. Lucio, a word with you, to which Lucio replies. A hundred, hundred, Francis Bacon in simple cipher, if they'll do you any good. Claudio explains that upon a true contract he had slept with Juliet in the belief they would be soon married, which had been temporarily delayed due to some complications over her dowry. Now, as a result of Angelo's decision to revive an ancient law that the Duke never enforced, making sexual immorality a capital offence, he had been sentenced to death. And the new deputy, now for the Duke, whether the tyranny be in his place or in his eminence that fills it up, I stagger in. But this new governor awakes me all the enrolled penalties which have, like unscoured armour, hung by the wall so long that nineteen zodiacs have gone round, and none of them been worn. And, for a name now, puts the drowsy and neglected act freshly on me. As Bacon succinctly put it in his private paper to the King, touching the compiling and amendment of the laws of England, there are a number of ensnaring penal laws which lie upon the subject, and if in bad times they should be awaked and put in execution, would grind them to power. The ensnaring statue is, Professor Strain correctly states, essential to the plot. Most obviously, the conflict of measure for measure grows out of the Duke's decision to awake an antiquated penal law that punishes fornicators with death. The subject of the reform of the law and snaring statutes had repeatedly been addressed by Bacon from the early 1590s in parliamentary speeches, the Gray's in Jester Grayorum and other dramatic devices, a speech in the House of Commons in 1601 prior to the revision of Measure for Measure and afterwards again in the House of Commons in 1607 and he was about to return to strict statutes and severe laws in the next scene of the play. In the meantime, the Duke, who had not left Vienna but secretly retired to a nearby Franciscan monastery, reveals to Friar Thomas the reasons for his actions. Indicating that they had some kind of previous unexplained secret or hidden relationship, the Duke says, My holy sir, none better knows than you how I have ever loved the life removed. The Duke informs him that he has left Angelo in absolute power here in Vienna, while Angelo supposes that he had travelled to Poland. For so I have stewed it in the common ear, and so it is received. The law has fallen into disrepute, and it is necessary to rebalance law and order in Vienna, and he is to return in secret to oversee the process.
We have strict statutes and most biting laws, the needful bits and curbs to headstrong weeds, which for these fourteen years we have let slip, even like an o'ergrown line in a cave that goes out not out to prey. Now, as fond fathers, having bound up the threatening twigs of birch, only to stick it in their children's sight for terror, not to use, in time the rod more mocked becomes than feared. So our decrees, dead to infliction, to themselves are dead, and liberty plucks justice by the nose, the baby beats the nurse, and quite athwart goes all decorum. Oh. The observant reader will have noticed that in the previous scene, Claudio says that the strict statutes had not been enforced for 19 years. But in the above passage, the Duke says the strict statutes and laws have been left to slip for the last 14 years. The word slip is an interesting choice. The phrase to let slip is to reveal something that is secret. In this case, to let slip, for those with eyes to see, the secret identity of the concealed author of Measure for Measure. 19 plus 14 equals 33. Bacon in simple cipher. The passage is brilliantly explained by Professor Strain. The making of laws without execution do very much harm, explained Bacon, for it breeds and brings forth contempt of laws and lawmakers and all magistrates, which is the very foundation of all misgovernance. Bad justices are thus the very occasioners of all injuries and injustice, and of all disorders and unquietness in the Commonwealth. In the third scene of Measure for Measure, Shakespeare's Duke of Vienna makes the same argument in more succinct terms. Echoing Bacon's comparison of a law without execution to a body without life, the Duke explains, Our decrees, dead to infliction, to themselves are dead, with the result that, Liberty plucks justice by the nose, the baby beats the nurse, and quite athwart goes all decorum. We bid this be done, he concludes, when evil deeds have their permissive pass and not their punishment. In an essay entitled Measure for Measure and the Discourse of Husbandry, Professor Bertram observes that our poet forges subtle connections between biological, political and economic forms of reproduction in the play, engaging the rise of state husbandry, which he likens to Bacon's utopia New Atlantis or Land of the Rosicrucians. As the Duke himself points out, he has neglected this role as head of the household. He has been like those fond fathers who merely threaten to use the rod but do not follow through. Now, ruling over his children, he wants to re-establish good husbandry. In its most extreme form, state husbandry expresses the utopian goals epitomised by Francis Bacon's paean to James I's husbandry, the New Atlantis, in which sexual pleasure that does not serve the state's needs has been eradicated, and there is no space whatsoever for private pleasure. Bacon's utopia contains a celebration of regimented husbandry called the Feast of the Family, in which exceedingly fruitful patriarchs are honoured by the state. All eros in the New Atlantis is channelled to the utilitarian reproduction of the patriarchal family or to the fecund instruments of Solomon's house, a research centre that specialises in husbandry techniques on a tremendous scale. In Measure for Measure, as in the New Atlantis, the institutional control of procreation and private pleasure is crucial to the creation of an orderly society. The Duke, it turns out, is the one who truly knows how to unfold the history and nature of his people, along with the properties of government. The Franciscan friar says to the Duke that while it rested in his power to unleash the pent-up justice when you pleased, it would have seemed more dreadfully new than it would from Lord Angelo, with the Duke accepting responsibility for giving the people too much of a free rein. Regarding the Duke's plan to deputise Angelo to execute and enforce law and justice as explained to the friar above, contrary to the too much licence and liberty given under his rule, speaking of this passage, Professor Jordan writes,
The figure of executive dissimulation had a wide representation on stage, but also in works on government. In itself, it posed a formidable problem. To dissimulate is necessarily to withdraw oneself from the societies in which one had expected roles to perform, and Measure for Measure suggests that it, the converse is also true. Simply by being absent, the Duke dissimulates. He is not where he should be. In effect, he is not. Like the Duke in Measure for Measure, his creator Bacon was adept at secrecy and, where necessary, dissimulation, which he had first learned at the feet of his father, Sir Nicholas Bacon, statesman and the holder of the highest legal office in the realm, and that of his mother, Lady Anne Bacon, a clandestine financial backer and supporter of Puritan clergymen, and, like her husband, a keeper of high royal and state secrets. His own writings are shot through with the need for secrecy in state and government, and, like his father, a great Elizabethan statesman, he too was a leading Jacobean statesman and holder of the highest legal offices in the kingdom. Francis founded secret orders, like the Rosicrucian Freemasonic Brotherhood, and adopted many pseudonyms and disguises, and no person more than him understood the need for secrecy and dissimulation when the matter required as expressed in his masterclass essay of Simulation and Dissimulation. There be three degrees of this hiding and veiling of a man's self. The first, closeness, reservation and secrecy, when a man leaveth himself without observation or without hold to be taken what he is. The second, dissimulation, in the negative, when a man lets fall signs and arguments that he is not that he is. And the third, simulation, in the affirmative, when a man industriously and expressly feigns and pretends to be that he is not. For the first of these, secrecy, it is indeed the virtue of a confessor, and assuredly the secret man heareth many confessions. In few words, mysteries are due to secrecy. Therefore set it down that a habit of secrecy is both politic and moral. For the second, which is dissimulation, it followeth many times upon secrecy by necessity, so that he that will be secret must be a dissembler in some degree. But for the third degree, which is simulation and false profession, that I hold more culpable and less politic, except it be in great and rare matters. The theme of the law and its execution carries over into the second act when Lord Angelo remarks that we must not let the law become like a scarecrow, which when not enforced, instead of scaring off criminals and predators, unafraid they perch on it. We must not make a scarecrow of the law, setting it up to fear the birds of prey, and let it keep one shape till custom make it their perch, and not their terror. The striking use of the phrases and imagery invested in a scarecrow of the law was again drawn upon by Bacon in a speech given in the House of Commons in defence of the King's right to impose impositions upon merchandises. As subsequent laws repeal preceding ones, so new judgments avoid the former. The records reverend things but like scarecrows. With the business of judges and justice concluded with the order to execute Claudio, the scene moves to what Castle describes as a court on the circuit in an English assize town a subject on which, as we have seen, Sir Nicholas Bacon and Bacon himself had occasion to discuss in private and parliamentary speeches, papers and letters. And into the court comes the constable elbow. The whole scene is dominated by the constable with his malapropisms and confused habits of speech, which continually gives rise to verbal misunderstandings to the frustrations of all those around him. 
In his role akin to an English judge of the Assizes, Aeschylus knows that Albo is ill-equipped for what is an important position in upholding the law in villages and towns around the kingdom. The whole system and selection of constables was in need of drastic overhaul and reform if the government and judiciary wanted to effectively deliver law and justice through the courts of Assizes throughout the country. In his legal treatise, touching the office of constable, consistent with that of Aeschylus in Measure for Measure, Bacon portrayed those types occupying the position of constable as uneducated and generally of low social status, stating they needed to be more capable and nor should they be attached to any man's livery. Meaning, able constables must be free and independent of the nobility and local magnates and ultimately answerable to central government via the judges and justices of the Assize Courts, previously headed by his father, Lord Keeper Sir Nicholas Bacon, and afterwards by himself as Lord Keeper and Lord Chancellor of England. While the provost waits on Angelo to speak with him concerning the harsh sentence passed on Claudio, he reflects that all sects and ages have indulged in fornication, yet in a complete abuse of power and of the law, Claudio is condemned to death for it. He appeals to Angelo to reconsider, but Angelo is unmoved and tells him to do his office or give up his place. Accompanied by Lucio, the virtuous sister of the condemned man, Isabella arrives, who the provost informs Angelo is to be shortly of the sisterhood, if not already, namely the female Franciscan order of St. Clair, to plead with him for mercy. The virtue of Isabella and her powerful eloquence awakes in Angelo a sexual attraction for her as she movingly pleads for her brother's life. The Duke, Bacon, disguised as Friar Ludovic, or a Lewis, Rosicrucian Freemasonic brother, visits the prison to minister to the prisoners, where on arrival he is met by the Provost. The Provost asks him, What's your will, good Friar? To which the disguised Duke replies, Bound my, by my charity and my blessed order, I come to visit the afflicted spirits here in the prison. The phrase blessed order is ambivalent and on the face of it would superficially seem to refer to his Franciscan order, but the friar is the duke in disguise, Bacon, and the order is also a disguise for the Rosicrucian order or Rosicrucian Freemasonic Brotherhood at whose head stood Bacon. The Provost introduces Friar Ludowick to Juliet, whom he informs the disguised Duke is with child, an act for which her lover is condemned to die. She tells him that her unlawful sex act was mutually consensual and freely confesses her repentance. The disguised Duke tells her he is going to see Claudio, who he has heard is to die tomorrow, to offer him some comfort. After Angelo had dwelt upon place and seeming form, Isabella arrives and renews her plea to him to save the life of Claudio. Angelo tells Isabella that he will only show mercy to Claudio if she gives up herself sexually to him. She declares that she would rather face death than give up her body to shame. Angelo tells her that he loves her, to which Isabella retorts that Claudio did love Juliet and you demand he should die for it. She scorns him for hiding behind his so-called honour and tells him that, unless he signs a pardon for her brother, I'll tell the world aloud what man thou art. He arrogantly replies that no one will believe her due to his unblemished reputation and my place in the state. And if she does not yield to his sexual desire, her brother Claudio must not only die the death, but his death will be cruelly drawn out to lingering sufferance by torture. The Duke, still disguised as Fry Ludovic, visits Claudio in prison and asks him if he hopes for a pardon from Lord Angelo, to which Claudio replies, hope is all that he has left. In a long speech, the disguised Duke counsels and prepares Claudio to meet his death. Be absolute for death, either death or life shall thereby be the sweeter. 
reason thus with life. If I do lose thee, I do lose a thing that none but fools would keep. I humbly thank you. To sue to live, I find I seek to die. And seeking death, find life. Let it come on. Isabella arrives and asks to speak to Claudio, and the Duke urges the Provost to bring me to hear them where I may be concealed, and the two of them conceal themselves to overhear the conversation between Isabella and Claudio. Isabella tells him that he must die, and Claudio asks if there is no remedy. He assures her that he is not afraid of death and that she explains to him that Angelo will only grant his freedom in exchange for her virginity. Although at first Claudio says, Thou shalt not do it, he is then overcome by the fear of his impending death and pleads with her to save him. Death is a fearful thing. The weariest and most loathed worldly life that age, ache, penury and imprisonment can lay on nature is a paradise to what we fear of death. The death philosophy expressed in Measure for Measure finds similar expression in Bacon's prose essay of death, the theme that haunts the whole of the play. A theme further explored and expanded upon in two full-length tracks on the subject of life and death. An inquiry concerning the ways of death, the postponing of old age and the restoring of the vital powers, and the history of life and death, issued at the time the first printed version of Measure for Measure was being published in the Shakespeare First Folio in 1623. The Duke, disguised as Fry Ludovic, informs Isabella that he knows of Angelo's unlawful proposition and puts to her his three-part plan to save her virtue, redeem her brother from the angry law and help a poor wronged lady. He tells Isabella about Mariana, who is betrothed to Angelo, but between the time of the contract and limit of the solemnity, her brother Fred Frederick died in a shipwreck, and with him her fortune and marriage dowry, as well as her husband-to-be, this well-seeming Angelo, who then abandoned her under the pretense of discovering she had been unfaithful. The Duke tells Isabella that despite all of this, Mariana is still in love with Angelo, and behind the pseudonym of Friar Ludovic, he sets out his secret plan. He instructs Isabella, under the cloak of plausible obedience, to agree to Angelo's demands, on the condition that their clandestine meeting takes place in shadow and silence, so that Mariana can surreptitiously take her place in his bed. The Duke, who is everywhere and invisible, concealed behind the cloth of his order and mask of Fry Ludovic, returns Aeschylus's greeting. Bliss and goodness on you, with Aeschylus asking him where he was from. Not of this country, though my chance is now to use it for my time. I am a brother of gracious order. The word order has a double meaning, firstly referring to the Duke disguised as a brother of the Franciscan order, named after St Francis, Christian name of Bacon, and secondly as a brother of the Rosicrucian Brotherhood, who in Bacon's New Atlantis, land of the Rosicrucians, although they knew all about the affairs of the outside world, remained unknown and invisible to others, and sought to build a just and perfect society. What follows is a simply remarkable cryptic speech delivered by Bacon, a Rosicrucian brother, behind his dramatic creation, the Duke, himself disguised as the Franciscan Friar Ludovic. What news abroad in the world? None, but there is so great a fever on goodness that the dissolution of it must cure it. Novelty is only in request, and it is as dangerous to be aged in any kind of course as it is to be virtuous, to be inconstant in any undertaking. There is scarce truth enough alive to make society secure, but security enough to make fellowship accursed. Much upon this riddle runs the wisdom of the world. This news is old enough, yet it is every day's news. I pray you, sir, of what disposition was the Duke? One that, above all other strifes, contended especially to know himself.
The remarkable speech, pregnant with layers of secrecy and hidden meanings, with its deliberate, incisive, cryptic sentences, has observed the great Shakespearean Professor Knight, a profound quality and purpose which reaches the very heart of the play. And, because of its critical importance, he felt bound to provide an expanded paraphrase of it to illuminate its concealed meaning. No news but that goodness is suffering such a disease that a complete dissolution of it, goodness, is needed to cure it. That is, our whole system of conventional ethics should be destroyed and rebuilt. A change, novelty, never gets beyond request, that is, is never actually put in practice. And it is as dangerous to continue indefinitely a worn-out system or order of government as it is praiseworthy to be constant in any individual undertaking. There is scarcely enough knowledge of human nature current in the world to make societies safe, but ignorant self-confidence, i.e. matters of justice, enough to make human intercourse within society a miserable thing. This riddle holds the key to the wisdom of the world, probably both the, the false wisdom of the unenlightened and the true wisdom of great teachers. This news is old enough, and yet the need for its un understanding sees daily proof. In other words, what Bacon is calling for is a universal reformation of the whole world, a treatise coupled with the first Rosicrucian manifesto, the Fama Fraternitatis, in their first acknowledged publication to the world. At the time Bacon was revising Measure for Measure, 1603-4, he was also writing and completing his revolutionary The Two Books of the Proficience and Advancement of Learning, Divine and Human, between 1603 and 1605, the year it was published, a survey of all existing knowledge with proposals for a new method of how it might be achieved to construct in the human understanding a true model of the world for the future benefit of mankind. We see there be many orders and foundations, which though they be divided under several sovereignties and territories, yet they take themselves to have a kind of contract, fraternity and correspondence, one with the other, insomuch as they have provincials and generals. And surely, as nature createth brotherhood in families, and arts mechanical contract brotherhoods in com communalities, and the anointment of God superinduceth a brotherhood in kings and bishops, so, in like manner, there cannot but be a fraternity in learning and illumination, relating to that paternity which is attributed to God, who is called the Father of Illuminations or Lights. This remarkable passage referring to a brotherhood in learning and illumination hints at or alludes to his Rosicrucian brotherhood that had not yet announced itself to the world, which was to come nine years later, in a collection of writings that included the tract The Universal Reformation of the Whole World, along with its first manifesto, The Fama Fraternitatis. Seeing the only wise and merciful God in these latter days hath poured out so richly his mercy and goodness to mankind, whereby we do attain more and more to the perfect knowledge of his Son Jesus Christ and nature, that justly we may boast of the happy time, wherein there's not only discovered unto us the half part of the world, which was heretofore unknown and hidden, but he hath also made manifest unto us many wonderful and never heretofore seen works and creatures of nature nature, and moreover hath raised men imbued with great wisdom, who might partly renew and reduce all arts, in this our age spotted and imperfect, to perfection, so that finally man might thereby understand his nobleness and worth, and why he is called microcosmos, and how far his knowledge extendeth into nature. The Rosicrucian Duke, disguised as the Franciscan Friar, visits Mariana at her home, and as Isabella arrives, he asks Mariana to leave them for a while. Isabella tells the Duke that Angelo has given her two keys, and they have agreed to meet in his garden at midnight. 
In a question which bears the dual quality of the literal and metaphorical, the Duke asks Isabella, but shall you on your knowledge find this way? But she assures him that Angelo, to be on the safe side, had, in a whispering voice, shown her the way twice. The Duke calls Mariana and tells Isabella to explain the situation to her. All alone, Bacon, behind the Duke disguised as Franciscan Friar Ludovic, reflects upon power and greatness, and how millions of deluded eyes think they see and know you, with volumes of contemporary and historical accounts full of false reports of your thoughts and actions, none of whom see the truth and the true you. O oh, place and greatness, millions of false eyes are stuck upon thee, volumes of report run with their false and most contrarious quest upon thy doings. Thousands escapes of wit make thee the father of their idle dream, and rack thee in their fancies. The Duke, disguised as the Franciscan friar, welcomes them back, and Isabella tells the Duke, whom of course she does not recognise, even though he's right before her eyes, that, if he advises it, Mariana is willing to participate in their secret plot. He states that Angelo is Mariana's husband on a pre-contract, and the justice of your title to him means it is not a sin to have sex with him an interpretation of the law that runs contrary to the strict application of the law made by Angelo for the imprisonment of Claudio, implying a critical difference between law and justice. The provost shows Claudio the warrant for his execution, for thy death, earmarked for eight tomorrow. The Duke, still in disguise, arrives and asks if anyone had come with a pardon for Claudio, knowing that Mariana, in place of Isabella, had slept with Angelo. Instead of a pardon, a messenger arrives with a note from Angelo, with clear instructions that Claudio be executed by four o'clock and his head sent to Angelo by five. Aware that Angelo has not kept his word, the Duke suggests Barnardine's head is substituted for Claudio's, but Barnardine is too drunk to face his execution. The Duke, who prides himself on his special ability to read the minds of men, says to the Provost, There is written in your brow, Provost, honest and constancy. If I read it not truly, my ancient skills beguiles me, and tells him that Claudio is no more guilty under the law than Angelo, who has sentenced him. So that he can prove it, the Duke tells the Provost he needs four days and asks him to undertake a dangerous mission. The Provost is unsure until the Duke, still in the habit of a Franciscan friar, shows him a letter in the hand of the Duke, with his seal upon it. The letter reveals the Duke is to return within two days, which is unknown to Angelo, who is himself about to receive an ambiguous letter, perchance of the Duke's death, perchance entering some kind of monastery, but by chance nothing of what is writ. The Duke says to the Provost, put not yourself into amazement how these things be. All difficulties are but easy when they are known. These words, writes Professor Wilson Knight, are meant to recall the mystic assurance of Matthew 10.26. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. When the prisoner, Barnardine, is summoned to be executed, he refuses because he has been drinking all night and is not fit for it. The provost suggests they send the head of another prisoner, the notorious pirate Ragusine, who has died that morning of natural causes and was of the same years and similar in appearance to Claudio. The duke instructs the provost to immediately send his severed head to Angelo. Alone, the Duke reveals his intention to write to Angelo, telling him that he plans to enter the city publicly and that from their meeting point at the consecrated fount he will proceed with Angelo, by cold gradation and well-balanced form. Isabella arrives and asks if Claudio's pardon has been sent. 
As part of his wider plan, the Duke tells her that Claudio's head has already been cut off and sent to Angelo. The Duke, whom she thinks is the friar, tells Isabella that the Duke is due to return tomorrow and will meet with Aeschylus and Angelo at the city gates for them to surrender the power. He tells Isabella to give Friar Peter a letter who will accompany her and Mariana to accuse Angelo before the Duke. The significance of the following scene was interpreted by Professors Barnaby and Schnell in their chapter A Commune by Holding Place, the Scene of Knowledge in Measure for Measure, as part of a full-length work analysing the relations between drama, literature and politics with Bacon's new experimental philosophy and science. At the gates of his own city, where he intends to exhibit the workings of authority in the street, the Duke, in Measure for Measure, produces a scene of knowledge that anticipates this Baconian habit of secrecy, even as it deconstructs the humanist ideal of theatrical display. Part of what the Duke manages to construct in the end is recognition among his subjects of the necessity of his authority. And just as critically, this necessity is made to appear to originate in something other than the logic of human affairs. He accomplishes this task in part by evoking that awe of divinity that, as Bacon asserts in Of Seditions and Troubles, must gird God's substitutes in reverence. Having shown that he knows how to strew rumours to achieve his ends, the Duke also demonstrates his capacity to satisfy the desire for certainty that his own equivocal actions have generated. The rumours, gossip and opinions he himself has encouraged are thus transformed in the final scene into a knowledge productive of authority. Paradoxically, then, the city streets become the very site for policing those boundaries by which authority maintains its privileged distance from its subjects, or, in Baconian terms, the Duke's own provincia of knowledge establishes as one of its key administrative outposts just that public space that Bacon had warned needed to be subjected to proper governance by the ministers of a centralising royal intelligence. The Duke, in his own person, discusses his plans to enter Vienna with Friar Peter, telling him that the provost knows our purpose and our plot, and instructs him to hold to our special drift, although at times he might have to deviate here and there as the matter unfolds. Isabella reminds Mariana that the friar said she must veil full purpose, keeping the fuller part of the secret plan. To continue the pretense, she has been advised the Duke may initially in public side against her, but in the end she, the concealed hidden truth will eventually be revealed to her full satisfaction. Friar Peter arrives to take them to meet the Duke, who is entering the city to a ceremonial fanfare and the triumphant sound of trumpets. In the final act, where all the deceptions and illusions are revealed and made known to the world of Vienna, a metaphor for the world itself, its creator, the Grand Master of Illusions, Bacon, through his character the Duke, who knows what to make known and to whom and when, masterfully delays the revelation of certain knowledge and facts, the removal of all masks and pseudonyms, and the revealing of multiple identities. The returning, all-seeing, all-knowing Duke is met by Angelo and Aeschylus at the city gates, and he thanks them for their service, giving no hint that all this time he had been carefully watching over them and their every move. With formal and polite exchanges completed, Friar Peter leads Isabella forward before the Duke. She kneels before him and loudly asks the Duke for justice, 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 justice. He tells her to deliver her complaint to Angelo. Angelo, whom she says to the Duke, would be like asking her to look for redemption from the devil, and begs him, hear me, oh hear me, hear. In order to maintain his lies and deception, Angelo steps forward in all innocence, and with mock surprise tells the Duke what she is speaking is bitter and very strange. 
His pretense and deception prompts Isabella, in the recognisable words of her creator Bacon, to respond with an essay on illusions and the strangeness of truth, especially to the unknowing and those easily deceived by so-called authority figures. She then urges the Duke to make the truth appear where it seems hid and look beyond false things that seem true. To make the truth appear where it seems hid and hide the false seems true. In their jointly written article entitled Authorised Versions, Measure for Measure and the Politics of Biblical Translation, Professors Andrew Barnaby and Joan Rye state Isabella shows a similar reverence towards the Duke's quasi-mystical knowledge. O gracious Duke, let your reason to serve to make the truth appear where it seems hid, and hide the false seems true. As if echoing the Duke's words, Bacon would remark in the advancement of learning that men must know that in this theatre of man's life it is reserved only for God and angels to be lookers on. Leave Bacon's godlike self in the guise of his divine creation, the Duke in measure for measure. My business in this state made me a looker on here in Vienna, where I have seen corruption boil and bubble till it overrun the stew, laws for all faults, but faults so countenanced that the strong statutes stand like the forefeet in a barber shop, as much in mock as mark. Continuing the pretense, Isabella informs the Duke that she is the sister of Claudio, condemned by Angelo for the act of fornication, and in probation for the Franciscan Order of St. Clair, and that when she went to visit Angelo to plead for his life, he told her he would only agree to it on the condition she gave up her chest body. In keeping with the agreed script, Isabella tells the Duke that out of sisterly love for her brother, she sacrificed her virginity to Angelo, who broke his promise and issued a warrant for Claudio's execution. The Duke pretends he does not believe her and insists someone must have put Isabella up to it and orders her arrest for slandering Angelo. Before she departs, the Duke says to Isabella, this must be some kind of plot and demands to know who knew of her intentions. Someone I wish were here, she tells him, Friar Ludovic, the assumed identity of the Duke, to which the Duke stealthily says out loud, who knows that Ludovic, and issues an order that his own pseudonymous mask be found. The conspiratorial charade is reinforced when Friar Peter steps forward and says Isabella has wrongly accused Angelo, with the Duke replying, We did believe no less. Know you that Friar Ludovic that she speaks of? And he does. I know him for a man divine and holy. Friar Peter claims Friar Ludovic is sick with a fever, and upon hearing of this complaint against Angelo, asked him to speak, as from his mouth, what he doth know is true and false. Friar Peter brings in Mariana and she enters veiled with her face hidden. The Duke asks her to show her face, but she refuses until her husband bids her. The Duke asks if she is married, a maid or a widow, but she cryptically denies all three. My Lord, I do confess I ne'er was married, and I confess besides I am no maid. I have known my husband, yet my husband knows not that ever he knew me. The woman who accuses Angelo of fornication accuses my husband, who at that time was having sex with me. With Angelo confused, the Duke mischievously interjects, You say your husband? Why just, my lord, and that is Angelo? Who thinks he knows that he ne'er knew my body, but knows he thinks that he knows Isabel's? Still deceived and confused, Angelo demands to see her face. My husband bids me, now I will unmask.
Angelo confesses he knows Mariana, but in the last five years he has not as much as even spoken to her, seen her, nor heard from her, and claims Mariana and Isabella are the mere instruments of some mysterious higher intelligence that has set them on. Angelo asks permission to find this practice out, and the Duke denounces his co-conspirators, Friar Peter, and those pernicious women, and tells everyone concerned, there is another friar that set them on, let him be sent for. The Duke orders Aeschylus to fetch Friar Ludovic. In other words, writes Professor Jordan, the Duke summons his pseudo-self as if to charge him and proceeds to leave the scene. The Duke returns disguised as Friar Ludovic, and Aeschylus asks him, did he set these women on to slander Lord Angelo? They have confessed you did. The Duke, in his pseudo-self, denies the charge. Tis false. He salutes Aeschylus, respect to your great place, and deceitfully asks him, where is the Duke? Tis he should hear me speak. Thus the dis disguised Duke would like to speak to his pseudo-self. Aeschylus tells the the Duke's pseudo-self, Friar Ludovic, that the Duke has given him the authority to oversee the trial and he will hear his testimony. The Duke, in the persona of his pseudo-self, says to Isabella and Mariana that the Duke is unjust in making them endure a trial before the person they have accused, prompting Aeschylus to angrily threaten to have the disguised Duke tortured on the rack for taxing the Duke with injustice. The disguised duke in turn responds, Be not so hot, the duke dare not stretch this finger of mine than he dare rack his own, who, like his creator Bacon in the advancement of learning, he is a looker-on here in Vienna. The enraged Aeschylus cries out, Slander in the state, away with him to prison. Lucio falsely states the Duke's pseudo-self, Friar Ludovic, slander the Duke. But the disguised Duke protests that he loves the Duke. I protest I love the Duke as I love myself. Aeschylus again orders the disguised Duke, Friar Ludovic, be taken to prison. And as the provost tries to seize him, in the ensuing struggle, Lucio pulls the Duke's hood off, revealing his true identity. The Duke has Lucio arrested and takes Angelo's seat, symbolising his return to power. Realising the Duke has known all along about his crime, Angelo confesses, O oh my dread Lord, I should be guiltier than my guiltiness, to think I can be undiscernible, when I perceive your grace like power divine hath looked upon my passes. Of the above, Professors Barnaby and Schnell incisively observe. In his inscrutable godlike intelligence of Angelo's crimes, the Duke appears to manifest the same character Angelicus that medieval and Renaissance political theology ascribed to the reigning monarch. This view of power is shared by the narrator of Bacon's New Atlantis, who remarks that it is a condition and propriety of divine powers and beings to be hidden and unseen to others, and yet to have others open and in light to them. Angelo asks the Duke to let his trial be his confession and asks to be sentenced to death. The Duke orders the penitent Angelo to immediately marry Mariana. He apologises to Isabella about the death of her brother. You may marvel why I obscured myself and did not use my hidden power to save him, but he died sooner than he expected. But peace be with him that life is better life past fearing death than that which lives to fear. Make it your comfort. Following the wedding ceremony, the newly married Angelo returns, prompting the Duke to say to Isabella that she needs to pardon Angelo for Mariana's sake. But since he judged Claudio, being criminal in double violation of sacred chastity and of promised breach, and for the death of her brother, the very mercy of the law cries out, and Angelo for Claudio, death for death, like quoth quit like, and measure still for measure. Both Mariana and Isabella plead for his life, but the Duke refuses to listen to their suit and instead turns to the provost and asks why Claudio was beheaded at an unusual hour of the day. 
the provost replies that it is what he was commanded to do. Had you a special warrant for the deed? asks the duke. No, he replies, it was by private message, for which the duke dismisses him from office. The provost humbly apologises and acknowledges that he thought it was wrong and that he had kept Barnardine alive to testify to it. The prisoner Barnardine is brought in with Juliet and Claudio, whose face is hidden. For all his earthly faults, the Duke pardons Barnardine and advises him to take advantage of this mercy to improve his life in future. The provost reveals that the hidden man is Claudio and he is also pardoned. The Duke proposes to Isabella and says if, if you will be mine, Claudio is his brother too. He also pardons Angelo, yet here's one in place I cannot pardon, meaning Lucio, who should be whipped first and hanged after, before ordering him to marry the woman he had made pregnant. Recalling that Lucio had on several occasions repeatedly slandered him, the Duke says, Thy slanders I forgive, as well as all his other crimes. Still ungrateful, Lucio protests that marrying a whore is worse than being pressed to death, and being whipped and hanged. In response to which the Duke tells him, slandering a prince deserves it. <coughs> As Professors Barnaby and Rye explain, it is Lucio more than Angelo whose final predicament most forcefully reveals how, in the new Vienna, past transgressions may suddenly come back to haunt one. Condemned to be whipped and hanged after, all this to follow his enforced marriage to the prostitute who has borne his child, Lucio finds his protest about the severity of the pun punishment met by the Duke's simple assertion, slandering a prince deserves it. Although we have no way of knowing if Lucio's alleged slanders are actually false, the mere accusation of royal impropriety suddenly becomes a capital offence because it undermines the public reverence wherewith, as Bacon explains, princes are girt from God, from of seditions and troubles. As Bacon himself puts it in his essay of seditions and troubles, Shepherds of people at need know the calendars of tempests in state, which are commonly greatest when things grow to equality, as natural tempests are greatest about the equinocetia. And as there are certain hollow blasts of wind and secret swelling of seas before a tempest, so are there in states. Of troubles imminent and trees and dark, thence warning comes and wars in secret gathering. Libels and licentious discourses against the state, when they are frequent and open, and in like sort, false news often running up and down to the disadvantage of the state, and hastily embraced, are amongst the signs of troubles. The intertwined themes of law and justice, sex and death, and the Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood that are threaded all the way through Measure for Measure are mirrored and reflected in more than 20 of Bacon's acknowledged writings and works. The central character, the Duke, is a complex dramatic portrait of his creator, Francis Bacon, the supreme head of the Rosicrucian Freemasonry Brotherhood, with the Duke in the play, watching over Vienna, just like Bacon, reflected in his Rosicrucian utopia, New Atlantis, watches over the world and the future of mankind. In the play, the Duke seeks to build a new, fair and just society, one based upon love, just as Bacon, with his Rosicrucian Brotherhood, set in motion a plan for a universal reformation of the whole world. Thanks for watching. For more details, please see the next slide.